tells us that as we walk with him, he blesses our lives and we bless others in return. We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. And uh, we're going to continue our series right now called The Blessed Life. And uh, as I've said the last few weeks, a lot of us really want the blessed life. We want everything to go right for us. We don't want anything to go wrong. We don't want any trouble. We don't want difficulty. We want the blessed life. You know what? The blessed life isn't about all the things going right. It's just about trusting in God and God will bless us in return. This week was a really hard week for me. Two of my friends died this week. One was killed on a motorcycle in Illinois and another one died in a hospital uh, just this past Sunday night, I think, or Monday. And it was just a difficult time. It was a place for me that grief became really real. I began to realize again that I seek the blessed life and I seek what God wants best for me in my life, but not everything turns out my way, you know? Um, and so I come to you this morning, not with a heavy heart, but with a heart that says, how can we walk in the blessing of God? I want to tell you that I love watching reality TV shows. I think I've confessed that before. I love shows like Survivor and uh, The Biggest Loser and big things like that. And there's a show right now that's on the Home Network, and it's called Home Free. Have you ever seen this show? It's called Home Free. It's with a host. His name is Mike Holmes, of all things. And uh, I think he's Canadian because of his accent, which is fine. But what he does is he's taking nine couples along this journey for nine different weeks. And each time they, or each week, they find an old dilapidated house, a flipper house, you know, and they, he purchased these houses in, in beforehand. And he takes all these couples and he teaches them how to do construction, teaches them how to do demolition, puts them on projects. They're in two different teams and some groups have to work outside and some of the other, the other group works inside and they have to restore the house. And then all week long is a competition. And what Mike does is he leads all these couples is he checks on their teamwork, how, they, how, they, how hard they work, what they're giving to the projects, um, how well they actually do the house. At the end of the week, what he does is he eliminates a couple who didn't work hard, who failed on the projects, who didn't quite make it. And instead of sending them home, he says, do you want to meet the deserving couple that gets this house? Because we're giving all these houses away. And the couple that feels rejected or eliminated or like a failure because they didn't quite work hard enough during the week, they get introduced to themselves. Mike pulls out a family portrait of them and says, you are this deserving couple. You get the house. So if you fail in the project, you get a free house. Uh, what? It's kind of like grace. It's kind of like God's grace. God says, uh, I want you to walk with me and the, the more you fail, the more grace I give you. It's this uncanny relationship we have with God that says, we think the, the harder I work, the better I'll achieve, the more I'll get to the end and the harder. And yet God says, I'll, I'll give you something free anyway. I'm gonna bless your life. I love this show. I cry every week when I watch it because the couple like this man is shocked. They just can't believe that they get this house. And each week is an elimination and then it gets down to two or three or gets down to one couple and they win this brand new house that he hasn't presented quite yet. It's a great show. The reason I bring it up is because we're talking about this blessed life and we want all this blessing, but we often don't want to work hard and seek out our, and, and live by obedience so that God sees our heart. God will bless us. We want to walk in faith with him. I'm going to look at a couple of scriptures this morning in this blessed life series and I want to just kind of highlight a few things. Here's Proverbs chapter 22. He who is gener has a generous eye will be blessed. If you have a generous eye, if you're generous toward other people, if you want the best for other people, God sees that and he wants to bless your life. I love this one in Luke chapter 6. This is Jesus talking. And he says, give to others and it will be given back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured out in your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
It, it, it kind of reminds me of how I put the flour in the flour container in my kitchen. Did any of you start off doing this? You rip the bag open and you spill half of the flour because you ripped it too fast. And then you pour it immediately into the deal and then it puffs everywhere and you get flour all over your kitchen. Any of you start doing it like that? I've learned now that you take the bag and you slowly cut it open so it doesn't dust everywhere. And you tip the container over and you tip the bag over and you slowly fill it and then you shake the container so it presses a little and then you put more in. Do you do it like that so you don't make a mess? That's kind of how giving is. That's how Jesus said is the more you give as you, uh, it's kind of like having something that's pressed together, shaken down, and God says, I will pour that over you. I will give back to you as you give to others. I want to talk about a couple things this morning. Well, this will be hopefully my final series, my final talk on money. Next week, we're going to talk about something more important than money. But today, we're going to talk about this. There's two responses that are wrong about God's blessings. And I think we should pay attention to these two things in our lives. The first response that is incorrect about God's blessing to us is that we should have pride. Right? I think if we have pride about God's blessing, then we're braggadocious. We're telling everybody else about it and all of a sudden it becomes more about us than about God blessing us. And when we have pride, about God's generosity or God's blessing in our life, this is a mistake. In fact, the church in Revelation, one of the seven churches that were talked about in Revelation, the angel came and spoke to John. Jesus talked about churches. And one of them is a prideful church. Listen to this in Revelation chapter 3. You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and I don't need a thing. Do you know any Christians that feel like that? Oh, I'm just fine. I don't need anything else. But Jesus says, you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Well, that, that's a good yearbook signing. You know, at the end of the year, you sign off your senior pictures. Well, you're, you're uh, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I mean, that would be an awful audit on our church. If we had pride, if we were all about how much God has blessed us, and if we could do that, we could look at this church and say, do you realize that the denomination let us borrow this church for the next five years at the least price we have, and we are so blessed? Let's just puff up a little bit. Let's get a little ego and have a little pride about how much God has given us, and if we did that, we would mistake what God's true blessing is. We could easily look at material things. The other wrong perspective of God's blessing is to feel the opposite, which is shame or to feel unworthy, to feel like I'm no good, I'm not worth this, I, I really don't deserve this, I don't really need this. And this is out of Genesis 32. Jacob prayed and he said, oh Lord, you who said to me, I will make you prosper, he stops and he says, I'm unworthy. Uh, all of this kindness and faithfulness you've shown your servant, I don't I'm not worthy for any of this. How would you feel as a parent if you give your kid a gift and, and they reject it? Oh, I'm, just, I'm no good. I don't really want this gift. I don't want to use it. Or you give them a new bicycle. You give them a new car. You give them something they can use and, and to better their life. And they go, oh, it's fine. I, I'm no good. I don't want it. And they just leave it alone. That would be the shameful side of God's blessing is to say I'm I'm not really worthy of these, this money or this job or the finances or the things you've blessed me with. I'm not going to use it. Here's the best response ever. The best response is to remember why God has blessed you in the first place. God has blessed you. That's God's choice. And then we remember why so that we can use it for others' good. We can bless other people. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says it this way. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The Apostle Paul had it right when he wrote to the Corinthian church. And he says, if you're generous, or if God has blessed you, then you can be generous to other people, and it will fill your life. Take some time this week to read 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. It's all about money. It's all about the Apostle Paul who says, God has blessed you generously so you can turn around and bless other churches, bless other people. And as you do that, you are responding in the best way 
to God's blessing. We're not hoarding up God's blessing. We're not keeping it all for ourselves. We're being a blessing and generous to other people. In fact, it started with Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. You remember when Abraham was blessed? Did he do anything beforehand to get a blessing? God picked him to be faithful, and then God blessed the nations. Listen to this in Genesis 12. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. That's an enormous promise. That's why we're sitting together in this room right now, is because God promised Abraham, I will bless others through you. You be faithful to me, and I'll bless the nations. You realize that this blessing is a a global promise. God is blessing the world. He is blessing the nations. As people walk with God and seek after God, God's blessing is totally upon them. So here's a fill in the blank on your program. Since God has blessed us with more, we will intentionally give more to others. Instead of being prideful and stingy, instead of being shameful and stingy or, oh, I don't deserve it and pushing it away, it's, God, you've blessed me with this, so I'm going to intentionally bless other people. So I'm going to talk about three kinds of giving today. Three different ways that God has given us the ability to be givers. So givers grow in their faith. Three kinds of givers, and you'll recognize all three of these, and you could be one of all three of these. You could be all three of them together. You could be one of each of them separately. Number one is this, the spontaneous giver. A giver who is emotionally driven, uh, led by their emotion, led by some little cute puppy commercial on TV some cute commercial or some sorrowful commercial of babies that are dying around the world and they need your money or some organizations that want to put out these kind of painful commercials and you're just so moved emotionally. There's nothing wrong with them, but people have figured out how to tap into our emotion of giving, right? They tap into how bad a problem is. And they tell us that we're just, we've we're, we got to solve this problem in the world. And it just gets you to move emotionally. So we're spontaneous in our giving. Somebody needs something from you. Hey, can I borrow this money? Can I have 20 bucks? Can I help do this? And it's a spontaneous, quick giving. This comes out of Luke chapter 10. You know the story of the Good Samaritan? When's the last time you heard the whole story together. I just want to read for you Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 35. Listen to this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Remember, this is a test. Hey, teacher, he said, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? Isn't that cool? Jesus asked him, well, what's your interpretation? How do you read it? And the guy says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So he got that right. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. I tell you the truth. Do this and you will live. Just simply do those two things. Love God and love your neighbor. And then the man kind of came back at Jesus and he said, well, then who is my neighbor. I mean, I can love God. Nobody can really see how I love God, but I can love him because he's invisible. But who is my neighbor? And you've all heard the story, I think. Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and they went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the, the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by along the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So a priest and a Levite, these are the people that are listening to Jesus talk right now. In fact, the man who's asking the question could possibly have been a Levite or a priest. He was a lawyer in his own right. He was one of the higher ups. And he said, oh yeah, who's my neighbor? And Jesus goes, well, you're the kind that would just walk by. And then he said, but a Samaritan... 
Oh, this got right to them. These people didn't like the Samaritans. The Samaritans were the outcasts. They were the ones that lived across the railroad tracks. They were the ones that didn't fit in the culture. They were the ones that were the half-breeds. They weren't really the pure breeds, the Jewish culture. They were the, the, the ones that people rejected, the push-aside people. Jesus said, but that guy, the Samaritan, he was traveling by and he came where the man was and he saw him, he took pity on him and he went to him. And he bandaged up his wounds and he poured oil and wine on him. And then he put the man on his own donkey and he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. This man did so much more than you religious people do. And he's a reject. He saw him. He went to him. He cared for him. He bandaged him up. He took him to a place that would care for him. All these things. And I'm sure this lawyer is like, oh, Wait, I thought I was just supposed to love God and love my neighbor, whatever that means. But here's the best part. The next day, he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So the innkeeper now is to keep track of whether he uses the little mini fridge you know, or takes the candy out of the little... Have you ever gone to a hotel and you're afraid to open the fridge because you don't want to spend an extra hundred bucks on your room because there's probably a bottle of water in there that costs 50 bucks and if you open it and there's a sensor in there and... So this guy goes, whatever he does, if he opens the fridge, if he watches TV, if he, you know, swims in the pool or gets in the workout room without asking, whatever, I'll just pay for that, right? That's my favorite part is that this man not only took care of the guy that was hurt and wounded, he also took care of him financially, he said, and here's a little extra. It's a spontaneous way to give. It's this way that says, whatever, I'll just take care of it. Do you know anybody in your life that has just offered to take care of a problem that you have financially? Oh, here's 50 bucks, just go have a meal. Let me fix that flat tire for you. Let me just, whatever, take care of it, it's on me. Let me fix your lawnmower or, hey, I understand that you have a broken window. Can I just replace that for you? And have you ever been able to do that for a neighbor? It's beautiful. The spontaneous giving. Here's the second kind of giving is strategic giving. This is planned giving. This is giving that has purpose in a sense of figuring out your budget, making a plan, making it work, uh, working out with what God has given you, giving a percentage of what you have, and it's a regular based giving. We have a thing in our church called e-giving, electronic giving. If you go on our website, you can actually sign up for electronic giving, which means uh, a portion of your home paychecks will go, you can sign up and it'll go directly to the church and basically you can just take care of that. So if you go on vacation, if you leave for Christmas and you come back, or if you're a snowbird and you go to Florida for the winter, you can continue to give because it's on electronic giving. It's strategic. When I was a young parent, my wife and I figured out these little boxes. Have you ever done this with your kids? Teach them how to give. We had three little boxes for our kids. They were little Tupperware things. And uh, what we did was we gave them to our kids and we said there's three different kinds of money that you're going to get in your life. As you get offer, um, as you get allowance and you get all this kind of stuff, there's three different things you can do. Do you know what they are? One of them is you can spend this money. So put a little bit of your money in your spend bucket. Another one we had was a giving bucket. There's put a little bit of money in your giving bucket. You don't get that money, you give it away. And the other money are a savings bucket. So you have three little buckets. You get to save a little, you get to give a little, and you get to spend a little. Does that make sense? It's just strategic giving. It's not that difficult. It's some easy way you can teach your kids. You can teach yourself. My wife and I still do envelopes in our, uh, in our house. We did this marriage, premarital counseling. And one of our counselors, he says, you know, if you take 20 envelopes and you mark them for all kinds of things and then you take your paycheck and you put them, cash it and you put it in these envelopes and you only spend the money in the envelope if you need the thing. Little grocery money, little haircut money, little car oil change money, a little bit of this and that and you adjust accordingly. We still do, after 22 years, we still do these little silly envelopes. But it's strategic giving. It's giving with a plan and a purpose. 
Listen to this out of the message in 2 Corinthians 9. Remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. That's a great line. Plenty of time to think it over and make up your mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting, against the emotional kind of giving. God loves it when the giver delights in giving. If you make a plan and you stick to the plan and you follow the plan, you will feel blessed because you're being obedient to God. God has put that in your mind. Some of our personalities in the room are very strategic and very uh, connect all the dots and make the list and check the boxes and that's great. God designed you that way. Maybe giving is more of a strategic method. I'm going to ask if Don would come up here and share just a little testimony about his financial giving. Just want to share just a little scripture first off. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. This is Psalms 119, verse 35 and 36. Uh, pastor's been talking about paying our tithes and giving and stuff. I was telling him this morning that one in and I kind of did a trial and error on this, mostly error, until we finally got it right. But we started out, we tried two or three different times to pay our tithes, but we always had the wrong motive. First two or three times we paid our tithes, we thought, Lord, we'll give you our 10%, but you dump a whole bunch of money on us when we give you our 10%. And that was the wrong attitude. <clears throat> you know, God, God tells us in his word how to do stuff. And he says, you, you obey my commands. You give the 10% and you give extra above that 10%. And I will bless you if you do it out of obedience to me, not with the thought in mind that I'm going to make you rich. God hasn't made us rich. But there have been numerous times, and I could stand up here for an hour telling you all the times God has provided over and above my paycheck for things that we've needed. And he has provided even before we knew. A lot of times he's provided even before we knew that we would need it. And it just comes back to the fact that that we are obeying God in paying our tithes. And I'm not standing up here for a pat on the back because, like I say, we learned this through trial and error. But we've learned that when we give to God, he is more than faithful to give back to us. Amen. Thank you. I think it's true. Sometimes we can try to outsmart God. Hey, God, watch this. I'm going I'm to do a little bit of this, and, and uh, maybe I'll give my 10% here. Maybe I'll, give the, maybe I'll give a little more, so I'll get a little bonus at work. Or, and we try to trick God, but Don's right. It's strategic giving is about a plan and a strategy and walking with the Father. And the Father can bless us if he wants to, but it's not the other way around. We don't seek that first. Here's another scripture out of Isaiah. It says, that generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. It's a plan. It's a way you decide what you're going to give and you follow through and be obedient. It's hard for some people who aren't faith people, aren't Christian people. They're, they see the religious side of church or they see the money side of church or they sort of look at the pastor who always talks about money. And they're like, yeah, we see what you drive. We know the clothes you wear. We watch your behavior. We know what you're doing, that blah, blah, blah. And it's not even about the result of giving. It's about the obedience to say, I'm going to be strategic and plan ahead. Here's the third kind of giver is a sacrificial giver. The giver that says, I'm going to sacrifice part of my life. I'm going to actually give more than uh, I actually have. And I'm going to sacrifice a whole lot and give to God and God can do with it whatever 
he wants. Have you heard of Pastor Rick Warren in California? He wrote a book, The Purpose Driven Life. They made, it made so much money, he decided to pay back the 26 years of salary back to the church, all the salary he had made, and he paid all that back to the church, and he said, I don't need any more salary or income. I'm doing fine with the book. And you would think, well, now he's a millionaire. It's easy for him to do that. No, it's not easy to do that. Then he decided, instead of just giving 10% back to my church, I'm going to actually give 90% of my income away, and I'm going to live on 10%. He's a reverse tither. He gives 90, and he keeps 10. That's a difficult way to live. No matter how much money you make, it's a difficult thing to do because you're saying, God, I'm giving you way more of my heart. I'm going to sacrifice my life for you and give this to you and whatever you want to do. And God is blessing the church around the world in Africa, in different parts of India, in different places that God is using that money. And it makes other people generous when you have that kind of attitude. This is a pretty amazing story I want to read to you out of Mark chapter 12. Listen to this. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury and many rich people threw in large amounts. Just pause for a minute. Let's take this apart. So Jesus goes to church. He's sitting at the temple and in that day they didn't take the offering or receive an offering with baskets around. They would have a, a money box that was, let's say, put in a place near the altar or put back on the back wall and Jesus sat up in the balcony and he watched people going back and giving their money. You know what that tells me? God pays attention to you. God's watching. God watches what you give. He watches your attitude in church. He watches how you work during the week. He's paying attention. So he sees these, these rich people just throwing in money. It reminds me of the time we lived in Chicago going to grad school. And in Chicago on their freeways, they weren't free. They were called tollways. And you had to pay a toll every five miles or ten miles or whatever it was. And they got creative enough where they didn't want to stop all traffic in order just to collect a few dollars, 75 cents in that day. So they created these sort of catch baskets that looked like half of a basketball hoop. And it was a plastic catch bin. And if you were good enough, you could take three quarters or take a bunch of dimes and some nickels. And as you're driving through, you could slow down enough with your window open and toss money into the catch bin. And hopefully it would all make it and you would just keep driving. There wasn't like a toll bar. There wasn't like a, a meter reader, all these things. Maybe they were looking at your license plate. But I, you figure out sort of, I got to get to where I need to get to. I keep a stack full of quarters in my ashtray and I take out three at a time and I drive slowly and I throw them in the little catch bin. That's kind of what I see Jesus looking at these rich people in the church, just throwing their money into the offering. I love that word, throw. It's like, I don't really need this. It's just sort of extra toss. And then the story gets deeper. He says, but a poor woman came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Do you realize how small that is? A fraction of a penny? What? Calling his disciples to him, hey guys, guys, come here. Let me tell you this. Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. This poor widow has put in more money in the treasury than all the other people. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. I found this picture of this lady with two copper coins in her hands and I think, really God? That offering is more than all the money the men threw in? And I say men because mostly the men would go to the temple and throw in their money or men were responsible in their family. And this woman who's a widow, so now she can go to temple because her husband has died. So now... Two little coins, and that is worth more, God says. So our giving, in a sense, our sacrificial giving, isn't always about money. It's about giving from your heart and giving of all that you have to God. I read about a pastor this week who took an offering plate from his church, and he stood in it, and he says, when the offering goes by, I put all of me in it. Can you imagine that picture? Of course, you can't stand in the offering plate. You can't 
fully get in here, but the picture is beautiful that God says, I want all of you in the offering, not just a dollar, not just two dollars, not just whatever you can afford. It's put in and sacrifice and give to God and God will bless in return. But it's not the game that Don was talking about. Okay, let's see how much God will bless me. It's I'm going to sacrifice my whole self and give to God. So here's a question. What about you? Where do you fit? How, how are these three different kinds of giving alive in your life? Are you a spontaneous giver, which is fine? But you can be moved to give to all kinds of things if you're an emotional person and every little commercial you see, you'll write a check. Or every time there's a tsunami in another country, you write a check to the Red Cross. Or are you a giver that just kind of doesn't think about your budget and you just sort of give money that fast, which is okay? Or are you a strategic giver that says, I'm going to make a plan, I'm going to give to God, I'm going to make it hurt a little bit because I'm pretty comfortable, I'm going to give to God a little extra? Or are you a, a sacrificial giver, one who says, wow, I'll just, I'll give what I have and even if it's my last thing, God's going to take care of me. The question that I ask myself is, how can I grow in my giving? Am I a, a money, like do I set a plan and I only give certain dollars because that's all I have? Or am I a percentage giver? And the percentage that I have, I give a percentage back to God and I trust God for what he's about to do. Here's a question for us this morning. What if God asked us to give 90% instead of 10? How would that feel in our lives? You know, God only asks us to give 10 and we get to keep 90. That's a pretty big difference. So we get to trust God for what God's doing in our lives. Nope. I'm Dave Volpe, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, Dean Anderson is sitting way up there in the back. My brother-in-law Dan is sitting in here. Last week we had a discussion how there is so much more we can give. Pastor Reed has been talking about tithing over the past several weeks. And every time a preacher gets up and talks about tithing, everybody thinks he's talking about just giving money. Tithing is more than just giving money. It's giving of yourself. It's giving of your time. It's giving of your talents. We have many people throughout the church, I'm sure, that can use a little bit of help once in a while because they may not know how to do a little carpentry job and they can't afford to hire somebody to do it or how to stop the leak in a faucet, and they can't afford to hide, hire somebody to do it. So what we want to do is put together a group of us, of the members of this church, whether you are a, a member or just one that attends on occasion, uh, just somebody that's willing to give of his time and his talents, or her time and talents, because, just for an example, or bookkeeping, or just any number of things. But over the next couple of weeks, if you would contact one of us downstairs in the fellowship hall, let us know who you are, what you can do, what you're willing to do, uh, and so forth. Not only for the congregation, but for the church, for the building, for the grounds, just all of this. We have several people. There's one young man in the back there. I know he's taken his time several times and just come down here out of the clear blue and started raking up or or bagging up leaves or trimming branches or whatever needed to be done. Nobody asked him to do it. He gave this out of the goodness of his heart. And this is what we want from all of us. We want to be givers, not takers. We don't all have money. I certainly don't have as much as a few people. But I have more than what I need, thanks to the good Lord. Just like Don, he has blessed me more times than I can count and more ways than I can, than I can recognize. So now it's time for us to give back. So if you would contact, again, either Dean Anderson, Dan Ramsire, or me, Dave Volpe, downstairs in fellowship after service sometime over the next couple of weeks, let us know, again, who you are, what you can do, what you're willing to do, uh, you know, what times you might have available. Maybe you're retired and you're just kicking around, you need something to keep you busy during the week. Um, Mama wants you out of the house for a few hours, whatever. But uh, please, let's all pitch in and try to help each other and grow together and, and be the good Christian 
followers of God that he wants from us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's a perfect segue into next week. You know, it's not all about money. It is. It's about serving. It's about giving. It's exactly that. Thank you, Dave, for saying that. And uh, let's close in prayer. God, it's true. We come into this place and some of us have money. Some of us don't have money. Some of us have um, more hurt than help. Some of us, God, carry so much anxiety and need and we need people to care for us. And others of us, God, are on the mend and healthy and want to help other people and we want to give. Lord, I pray that none of us is prideful and none of us has shame. That we become the community you've called us to become. I can't help but think of the little boy that had the lunch, the little fish and the bread. And Jesus said, well, what do you have? And he took the fish and bread and multiplied it to thousands and thousands of people Lord, if you can multiply fish and bread, you can multiply money, you can multiply generosity, you can multiply our simple help, God, that feels like a small schoolboy's lunch. God, would you move in us and awaken us to how much generosity you've given us that we might give to others who have need? Lord, I pray this morning that if there are people in this place or people that hear my voice that don't know you, God, that they might see the generosity of Jesus who was given from God, sacrificed in order to have a loving, gracious relationship of forgiveness with the Father. I pray that now if that's you, you simply pray and say, Jesus, come in my life and teach me how to be a giver more than a taker. Teach me how to share more than keep. God, move in my life and teach me to grow with Jesus. We come before you, we ask you to move this week in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. amen. So as we go, I'm reminded again that some of us need prayer. Some of us need immediate prayer, immediate care. We have this prayer room that's open in the back and you're welcome to go and pray with Dean or with Pat or who's back there and just have them say a prayer over you, pray with them, share your concerns. Here's the thing about our generosity is we want to share our good and our love and generous heart with each other. We also want to share our hurt and how we carry each other and become the community God's calling us to become. Do you know as school starts and as, as we continue to get into the routine of life, this church is going to begin to grow. We're going to begin to see how God is at work among us and we want to be the hands and the feet and the helpers around with each other. Amen. Will you receive the blessing of today? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen.